और एंड और राइट टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू कवर डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ अश्योरेंस राइट डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ अश्योरेंस दिस इज वेरी अ इम्पोर्टेंट डॉक्ट्रिन बिकॉज सो मेनी क्रिश्चियंस दे आर लैकिंग दिस Uh, assurance uh, many christians who are saved lack assurance what happen if you lack assurance then of course then your christian life cannot be as lively as the bible promise you, uh, uh to for us to enjoy okay and you already know uh, the catholic doctrine of assurance is almost impossible for ordinary people to achieve because their doctrine of assurance is what their salvation is faith plus good works right so it depends on how much you perform good works in your lifetime then how can you be sure that you you are uh, definitely saved so no matter how hard you try to work still you're not sure you cannot be sure so this is a big difference between protestant doctrine and uh, catholic doctrine of assurance Okay, uh, hopefully and prayerfully, you and me, we all should have this assurance. Okay, and let's see what assurance means then in the Bible. Assurance is very complex rather than a simplex. Development and advance always involves the recognition of the inherent complexity of reality. Assurance is complex in this sense that in so far as it is a persuasion that Christ is my a faithful savior yeah we can confess that Christ is my a faithful savior but what this involves not only objective fact that Christ is a, a faithful savior but I should fear I have to have a, some kind of a subjective feeling and also knowledge or those things right so it involves not only knowledge and of and trust in Christ but also reflective activity this is what my what I go through right of reflecting on the understanding of the significance of Christ for myself because i'm a complex phenomenon i'm a complex being spiritually psychologically physically and also psychosomatically psychosomatically means a uh, uh, the mental soul and body together you know it inevitably follows that the realization of our assurance may be deeply complex phenomena yeah so when we say oh, do you have assurance it is not that easy you know uh, to ask that question and also to answer that question because of this complex phenomena but there we are bringing together two huge and complex realities the gloriously complex reality of christology yeah who uh, jesus christ is and what he has done all those things very complex because he's you know <laughs> nobody can understand 
comprehensively. He's 100% God and 100% man. What do you mean by that? You know, nobody can uh, uh, describe it as God can describe, right? So it's very complex reality of Christology and the perplexingly complex reality of my own being. A, do you know yourself? Makarao, can you tell me who you are? Very hard. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a very simple person. I'm outgoing, things like that. We can say that, but that tells about just less than 0.001% of yourself. You know? Human beings are very uh, complex realities. Yeah, so Christology and perplex perplexingly complex reality of my own being with all my baggage and idiosyncrasies. What is idiosyncrasies? I have my own peculiar characteristics. That's why every individual is very different, right? Even identical twins are different, right? Their character, they look alike, but the way they think, their temp uh, temperament, attitude, everything different. That's, you know, idiosyncrasies. And we have all this baggage, you know, spiritual baggage and uh, uh, physical baggage, everything, all these problems. <laughs> and bringing together the Redeemer and the fallen creature is inevitably open to deep complexities. Therefore, assurance is complex. It is one of the most stubborn problems of Christian uh, ministry to bring the unassured to assurance. For example, when you do ministry now, or when you lead Bible study, you know, as a, a church a leader, then inevitably you you will deal with uh, a people, Christian people, even non-Christian people. But how you persuade them, this is the, you know, uh, to persuade unassured Christians to assurance. This is one of the most uh, uh, stubborn problems. If, if, if you deal with them, you will see tons of uh, Christians who are lacking this, you know, assurance. I'm not sure whether I'm saved or not, you know like that, then how you lead them from this unassured uh, uh, situation to an uh, assured situation. That's very complex and uh, uh, a difficult thing to do. One of the reasons we often fail to do this is we focus on assurance itself. Oh, you're lacking assurance. Yes, so be assured, be assured. No, no, that's not the right approach on which the doctrine is not itself founded. Assurance is our union with Christ, which itself is complex, coming to a glorious self-conscious awareness. Then what is assurance grounded on? By what means does it become ours? The answer in keeping with Westminster Confession of Faith 14, that is a, a, a saving faith, is that the means by which assurance is ours is a fourfold. It's a fourfold uh, assurance. First, it is ours through faith in Christ. Yeah, so you can never have an assurance without uh, having a faith. You know, faith and assurance is in, inseparable. So it is ours through faith in Christ. And then secondly, like to go for, it develops in the context of a clear understanding of grace of Christ. So we got to understand what the grace of Christ means. In other words, what is the gospel? What is the content of the gospel? And it consistently contextualizes and that is the third uh, 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 thing that we have to dare. 
is consistently contextualized by walking in the way of Christ. That is what we have to imitate Jesus Christ. We have to live a Christian life. Yeah, so this is like, you know, living, a, uh, living with a good uh, works. This is a, always, you know, like a kind of sanctification process. And finally, it is realized by the Holy Spirit again. You know, nothing about the gospel can be done by our human individuals. Always has to have what? The Holy Spirit to work. Okay, then the first thing is assurance is ours through faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. Faith is a, a Christ is source. We already covered what the faith means, right? Uh, uh, several weeks ago. Yeah. What is faith? Faith is the means by which we draw Christ to ourselves. The very act of faith, a certain confidence or assurance seminally present. So, the germ of assurance is implicit in saving faith. Later on, we, we will cover, you know, in the Reformation time, assurance was kind of a, a, a essential element of a, a, a saving grace. But later on, this Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, almost uh, 100 years later, yeah, it was made. In it, it says, assurance is not the essence of saving faith. You know, that means you can be saved and still you may be lacking assurance. Yeah, so what is the, why the difference came? But that is because, you know, the Reformation age, they were split from Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, so the enthusiasm, all these uh, uh, circum uh, circumstances of that time was very different from 100 years later. You know, so there's a, a little uh, uh, a difference right there. But regardless, the job of assurance is implicit in saving faith. This is important. At the lowest ever faith and hope and love, his confidence never drops to the height of an unbeliever's highest pitch, highest faith. So if you, you and me, we are believer, then even if our faith is the weakest, still it is the higher than unbeliever, unbeliever's a blind faith. That's what he's talking about, all right? This emphasizes that the context in which assurance is ours is always the context of the actual exercise of faith. It is assurance of Christ's ability to save us, which is had by faith. Yeah, you cannot be saved apart from faith. Neither can you have assurance. Faith brings union, assurance only in context of union. So we deal with all these things now in the context of a union with Christ. Right, But because faith brings us out of darkness into light, wrath of grace, at the lowest ever faith, hope, and love, your consciousness as a believer can never drop below the consciousness of, of the unbeliever's confidence and hope in his relationship at its highest pitch. Yeah, so at this moment, I want to share with you the fact that, you know, no matter how confident the unbeliever look, you, know, you look around your neighbor, and there are tons of uh, uh, unbelievers who live confidently. Don't be deceived by them. 
because their confidence comes from their own person, own being. It's very shaky. It doesn't have a very stable uh, a ground. But your confidence and my confidence, assurance, come from Jesus Christ, who is God. Right? That's why our confidence, even if our weakest moment, our weakest faith is stronger. Yeah? And actually, it's a qualitatively different from the confidence that the unbelievers have. That's what it means, all right? Assurance of salvation is honed to a proper self-consciousness by a right understanding of the grace of God in Christ. This is a second, you know, fourfold, uh, uh, fourfold definition of, uh, is it definition or fourfold, you know, doctrine of uh, assurance. This is second one. First one is uh, uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Second element is what? Assurance of salvation is honed to a proper self-consciousness by a right understanding of the grace of God in Christ. This grace of God in Christ, in other words, the gospel, right? There are three enemies to assurance. What is it? What are three enemies? Our endemic capacity to smuggle our contribution into this. You know, whenever I read this kind of a, a statement, I begin to think more deeply about my sinfulness. Wow, this is a simple nature. It's not, you know, ordinary thing. You know, we, we play just a lip service all the time. Why? Because our society is only, you know, talking about political correctness and good things. Oh, you look good. You, you know, you you are good and I'm good and everybody's good. Why? We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. But in that way, we are contradicting the teaching of the Bible. Because Bible always emphasized the fact that if we are separated from God, that is unbelieving state, then we are worse than animals. You know, we are like animals because we are dead. That means we are totally depraved people. That is why the Bible says, you know, we are the weakest. We become the weakest creature in the world. But nobody thinks that way except Christians, except believers, right? And even if, even after, what is the most characteristic, most prominent characteristic of unbelievers? That's a self-righteousness. You know, that we have all become our own God. Because Genesis chapter 3, Satan deceived our first parents in that way. Uh-uh. When you eat of it, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Yeah, so everyone, every human being has become its own God. Yeah, so now that we believe in Jesus and we become different people, now we are saved people. But still, deep inside, what occupies our heart and mind is this. Legalism. I'm what, when I do something, I can contribute to my own salvation. You know, we deny it. Yeah, you deny it because you know in theory or in doctrines that we are saved by grace alone, right? Grace of God in Christ alone, we are saved. But in daily life, 
we do not live that way. What is it? Our endemic capacity to smuggle our contribution into this. This is always lurking in our hearts. Every moment, every day. Yeah, so the fact that we become aware of this fact itself will be tremendously helper for our becoming like Jesus more and more every day. Because the more you get to know, the more you get to close to Jesus Christ, the truly you feel that you are worthless. That's why what make that's what make us humble person. Because the more we come to know Jesus Christ, the more we come to know ourselves. What we see, nothing good really lives in me. Yeah, even if when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but still, the bottom part, dead inside. Still my self-righteousness right there. Subtle legalism that takes just occasion by uh, a grace. But from then on establish itself on works. That is why, you know, like this, hey guys, you know, like this expression, you, you memorize and think about this all the time. It will really help us our becoming, you know, humble person and also thankful person. Because even some people praise you. Wow, so cloud to your best, you know, you're my man, you know, I, wow, you're, you're terrific. Still, deep inside, you know, apart from God's grace, that you're nothing, you know. So you, you not only meditate on this, you teach your congregation you know, native inability to believe that we are freely justified, uh, justified by Father. We always want to contribute something. Eh? Roman Catholics, they just openly teach that. But we Protestants, we openly oppose that, but deep inside, the indwelling sins always try to exalt us and making us think that we are good, we are all right. What I'm doing is, you know, a good. It will please God, things like that. So, consciously or unconsciously, we contribute by our self-righteous acts, try to contribute to our salvation, then what happens? Of course, then we will undermine the grace of God, undermine the grace of God in Christ. Then we will undermine the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that much. Then, consequently, we cannot experience Christ's miraculous power which will transform you and me in the image of Jesus Christ every day more and more. You get it? Yeah, so recognition of the eschatological character of justification. Okay, yeah, you meditate on this and we really uh, receive a lot of uh, 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 grace. Wow, this is gospel. Is that's why everything you know, and you and me, we believe in Jesus. Wow, what a highest privilege that we are enjoying. Okay, B grounds or means of assurance. The ground of assurance is faith, and yet. We must realize that believers are wrecked by unbelief. Yeah, this this thing also, you know. Don't be naive. Once we are saved, we are always saved. That is true. But in spite of that 
a statement be true all the time, we have to acknowledge even at the height of our faith life, still we will be afflicted by our unbelief, all right? In the constant re-smuggling of works into acceptance of God, which is so characteristic of evangelical believers, a misunderstanding of the gospel. This is the foundation of grace in the work of the Son. Rather than in the heart of Trinity, thus producing distance and even dichotomy between the Son and the Father that from a psychological view makes it very difficult to rest in Christ Jesus. We must understand the work of Christ as giving us righteousness, as a mediator before the Father or righteousness in which we actually stand. How important then the principle yeah, so what is, yeah, it's a little bit difficult, may, maybe difficult for you to understand, but it's not difficult uh, a statement uh, to understand. Just uh, succinctly uh, speaking, it's, uh, you know, justification by faith alone. That is the amazing statement. Actually, when we live our Christian life, it is not easily fulfilled in our actual life. The fact that we are justified by faith alone. Why? Because of our tendency to try to think in unbelieving a uh, 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 state, like, oh, I'm okay, what I'm doing is good, you know? So I'm not that bad person. I don't deserve hair. You know, things like that kind of a, a self righteousness. This is a really in uh, preventing us from enjoying full degree of God's grace in Christ Jesus. That's what it says, right? How important then the principle that justification is rooted in the imputation of both active and passive righteous, uh, uh, righteousness of Christ, not my own righteousness, not my own goodness. No, no, no. Because nothing good lives in me because of the total depravity of a human being. So we rely 100%. We should rely on the active and passive righteousness of Christ. In other words, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and imputation of that righteousness to us, that means God proclaimed that I am and you are righteous and you are justified because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That faith will give us assurance and that grace will give us assurance. Okay? And then, what? This is actually the third, you know, I say one basis of assurance in first John, but this is the third aspect. You know, I just begin at, at the beginning of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a note is not very clear. I'm sorry uh, on that. But this note says what it says right here. By what, yeah, what is such assurance grounded on? By what means does it become ours? The answer in keeping with, you know, is that by the, me the means by which assurance is, is ours. Fourfold, right? It says fourfold. The first one is uh, faith in Christ. The second assurance aspect is understanding of grace of Christ. Now, what? By working in the way of Christ is the third aspect. But, you know, I put it just number one. Actually, this should be the third aspect, you know, uh, basis of assurance in First John. So we might call this walking in the way of Christ, same thing, right? Here, 
the principle, uh, I better write here somehow. Three, something like that. Oh, you know, it's three. Let me see. Oh, I better not change, you know, it 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 it, it will then uh it will uh confuse more. I guess uh just a little bit the oh. yeah as as before, okay. You just know this is the third aspect, all right. Here the principle is that high degrees of Christian assurance are not compatible with low levels of Christian obedience. If Christ is not actually saving us in the obedience of faith, then our confidence that he is our savior is bound to be on, uh, bound to be on the mind. What does that mean? If you say you are assured of your salvation, you say you're confident that you're saved, all right? Even though you say this, if you do not live a, a very good Christian life or sanctified life and just to keep on sinning uh, openly, then your, self, uh, your assurance will be inevitably undermined. That's what it means. Yeah, so I, our, uh, our uh, sanctified holy life and assurance kind of a parallel. That's what it means, all right? If Christ is not actually saving us in the obedience of Christ, then our confidence that he is our savior is bound to be on the mind. Yeah, so Christ is actually uh, uh, saving us in what way? Outwardly, our obedient life. That's what it means. This is the reason why there's a strong link in the New Testament between enjoyment of assurance and faithfulness and Christian obedience. See? There's a very strong uh, uh, connection. But you will find, even among your uh, congregation, church members, what you're going to advise or how you're going to deal with uh, uh, church members who say, oh, yeah, I know, I, I'm saved. You know, I, I have never uh, uh, shaken in my faith. And you, you, you see his or her life, Christian life, and very, you know, simple life they live. Then how are you going to uh, counsel them? Very difficult. Because outwardly, he or she is uh, living a life that contradicts the biblical Christian life. They lack Christian obedience then how are you going to deal with those people? This is what it says, you know. First John is written in large measure to assure Christian believers. Then, you know, in that kind of case, you have to confront that person and making them realize that if they, what they, you know, say, is really uh, agreeable to Christian life, then they should uh, correct their life and live a good Christian life. They have to change their uh, Christian life. All right? So, 
First John is written in large measure to assure Christian believers. That's why we deal with assurance, particularly in First John, because it has this in mind when uh, Apostle John was writing this. Okay. For example, First John five thirteen says, "I write these things to you." who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is about assurance, right? He points out four manifestations of ways faith works out in the Christian believer to encourage assurance precisely because they manifest the consistency of the possession of Christ with the claims of grace. Look at this. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. Yeah, so when we say, yeah, I love Jesus. And if I do not do not live an obedient Christian life, then what? Then <laughs> this word of Jesus Christ contradict my way of life. Okay. <clears throat> One. Obedience to the commands of God to love God and love our neighbor is one of the marks of a genuineness of the faith that we profess. Do you see, uh, you know, last Friday we, uh, we learned uh, Christian ethics. Here again, the same thing, the Ten Commandments. What is the summary of Ten Commandments? To love God and love our neighbor. Uh, this is the way, this is what we're talking about, obedient life. Obedient Christian life is nothing other than keeping or enjoying the requirements of Ten Commandments. All right? And the, also it is one of the uh, uh, outward marks of the genuineness of faith, that is a Christian assurance, right? Then within the context is a second mark in which this is more narrowly defined in terms of doing righteousness. Thirdly, now speaking even more narrowly, yeah, we narrow down, down, down. There is what he describes as a not sinning. And finally, there is walking in love with respect to our fellow believers. It's all talking about the same thing, you know, but narrow down, narrow down different uh, expressions. Well, all about regarding to Christian assurance. All right. Consequently, why this self-reflection and self-observation is never the basis for Christian assurance. Why? Because the ground is Jesus Christ and his grace, not us. Right? But however, it is a great encouragement to Christian assurance. If Jesus Christ is really the Savior, then of course he will transform me in the way that I keep Ten Commandments. I become obedient Christian. That's what it means, all right? It is the evidence that is the, that the Christ to whom we profess as Savior really has saved us and is saving us. Amen. See? Yeah, so always what I want to want to share with you all the time is, you know, no matter what kind of theological course that you're taking, don't matter. The final point is what? Do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. Do you, do you love God with all your heart and mind? Yeah, I'm trying and that's my direction. Then what? Then without exception, you will become the most valuable and happiest person in the world. That's it. And evangelism will take place in your life. 
Okay, finally, this is the fourth aspect, or told the last uh, uh, aspect of assurance. What is it? Testimony of the Holy Spirit in Paul. Okay. Yeah, here. What is the testimony of Holy Spirit? Romans 8, 15, 16, it says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Who is it that cry, Abba, Father? Is it the Holy Spirit that makes me cry, Abba, Father? Or is it the Holy Spirit and I? Together, we both say, Abba, Father. Yeah, the, the, we, we will cover this argument, but the conclusion is, together, you know, we cry, Abba, Father, with the help of the Holy Spirit. The notion of the witness of the Spirit has played a major role in evangelical theology's understanding of the nature of assurance. assurance. When Paul speaks here about the joint testimony of the Spirit in verse 16, the major exegetical question is whether he is speaking of the testimony of the Spirit to our spirit or with our spirit. I said more uh, idea, better one is with our spirit. But to our spirit cannot be ignored uh, you know, completely either. One of the advocates who says a true Holy Spirit testimony to our spirit, the represented theologian is Cranfield. He says the testimony of the spirit must be construed as a testimony to our spirits rather than with our spirit. He does so ultimately on the theological consideration, not exterically, but theological reason. He say that. Why he say? Why he, he wants to? He says, "What standing does our spirit have in this matter of itself? It has no right to testify to our being son of the sons of God." So what he's saying is, without you know, Holy Spirit, I cannot confess just to myself that Jesus is the Christ, myself, that Abba Father, because nothing good lives in us. That's what, it, it, what he's saying. So theologically, he's approaching this. So he says, settle the matter theologically, okay? So or, again, you know, uh, like this, this is a a, a a Greek word. Bear witness with. Su means with. Yeah? Martre means a bear witness. So it's a conjoined witness. But the whole context in which Paul is writing here is a context in which he uses several expressions characterized by the use of a soon, you know, like here. Prefix. Yeah, we don't have to go through this, all this. Paul seems to be making the contrast in which the spirit's cry takes place in the context of my, spi of my spirit's cry. But very parallel passage we can find in Galatians 4, 6. It says, because your sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit cries, uh, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Yeah, so both the statements by Paul talking about this cry, Abba, Father. So in that one single cry, issuing from the believer, both my spirit and the Holy Spirit give joint testimony, not just the uh, uh, Holy Spirit 
testimony to our spirit, but rather we jointly cry, Abba, Father. Here, Paul may be thinking of a Deuteronomy principle of two witnesses needed to establish truth, right? So when you sue some, someone, things like that, or uh, judge other people, you need two witnesses at least in order that testimony be you know, uh, established as true. OK. Uh, crying, it's a crying, it's a cry denotes the idea of loud crying ordinarily in the context of Christ. Yeah, this is important for our understanding cry, Abba, Father. In what kind of situation we cry, Abba, Father? When we really believe that, you know, uh, intimately, so we cry, Abba, Father. No, no. The, the, the context is what? When we are in danger, then we, 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 we help me, save me, you know? Oh, help me. Like that kind of a, 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 a cry it, this uh, context talking about. So it's like Jesus cries out on the cross. My God, my God, why thou hast forsaken me? No, think that kind of cry. The last breath, the final cry for her. You know, kind of a, almost a helpless, you know, that kind of situation. So the contrary to the way, this is sometimes understood in a more charismatic reading of Romans 8. Why? Because Rome, the charismatic people, the Pentecostal people interpreting Romans 8, you know, 15, 16 as a speaking in tongues. But the, no, no, that's not what it means. Paul is not speaking here of the tranquility the Spirit brings us so that we rest quietly in Father's bosom. You know, like, oh, Abba Father, thank you so much. It's not like that kind of situation. Rather, he is speaking of a shrieking out. Father, 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 help me. You know, that kind of cry. What is it? It is precisely at a time of need and crisis that this testimony kicks in into the experience of the believer. Yeah, so if you and me, if we are very mature Christians, always filled with the Holy Spirit, then we will not uh, 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 cry Father like this way usually. Because we know we rely on Jesus Christ. So this kind of cry, Abba, Father, apply those people who are at their lowest faith level. You know? So if they do not seek out a, a, a God, then they're, they're, they have no place, to, no place to turn to. In that kind of a, a, a moment of crisis, cry come out. That's what you know, this uh, 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 note is talking about. But what does the unbeliever cry out when in distress? Okay, so now with this kind of a, the lowest web of a, a, a Christian's uh, a cry and compare this with the unbeliever's cry. Okay, then why? But what about what does the unbeliever cry out when in distress? The highest he will cry, cry out is just, oh God, help me. You know, it, it's just out of, in, intuitively come out because all human beings are made in the image of God, but nothing more, nothing less. But it is not within this, within his instinct to cry out, Abba Father, because no matter how noble or how uh, uh, strong their faith may be, 
the unbelievers faith never make the unbeliever cry out abba father why because this is not in the vocabulary of, of the unbeliever because he is not their father in this sense so they can never you know cry abba father of course they can say oh god help me but they can never say abba father why because God is not their father, all right? So this is a treasure of Paul's understanding of ministry of Holy Spirit. That very instinct to reach out to God, specifically known as Father in Jesus Christ, which is instinctive to the believer in his dark this moment. Yes, yeah, this is a, when you and me, in our darkest moment, in our lowest state, in our faith level, still we can cry, Abba, Father, because he's truly our Father. But non-believer can never say that. Why we are dealing with this? Yeah, so even though we have a you know, weak faith, still if a truly uh, a born-again Christian, then we can cry out. Abba Father, that really helps our assurance. You get it? It is so important for us, contrary to an element seen in the evangelical and even the Reformed tradition that supposes that the testimony of the Holy Spirit is the highest form of assurance, therefore reserved only uh, for only the choicest believers. But this is wrong, right? But actually, Paul sees it coming to the believer at his or her lowest, not the highest. Okay? Oh. Let me uh, re repeat again. It is so important for us, contrary to an element seen in the evangelical and even the Reformed tradition, that supposes that the testimony of the Holy Spirit is the highest form of assurance. No, no. It is the lowest, you know, can be applied to the lowest uh, level of believers. That's what it means, right? And they're reserved for only the choice of believers. But no, Paul sees it coming to the believer at his or her lowest. So faith in Christ. Yeah, so this is the conclusion again, the fourfold uh, truth. First, the faith in Christ. The second, faith, right? It's understanding the grace of God in Christ. The third fold is faith coming to expression in the obedience of faith. And the lastly, uh, faith being sustained as the faith of a child to the father within the context of the witness of the Holy Spirit. These are the means by which assurance is uh, sustained and enjoined in Christian life. You get it right? All right. The grounds of my assurance is not my sanctification. Yeah, of course it's not. But it, it, it is still related, still linked to. But if there is a lacking in my life evidence of sanctification, yeah, so for example, I say, oh, I'm confident that I'm saved. I'm, I have assurance. But when I look at my life, so simple, feel, you know, sin filled life I'm living, then of course it will undermine my assurance, right? So my what what I say, oh, I have a confidence. That is just an em empty, vain confession. Why? Because my life definitely related, you know, to assurance. So then that is counter evidence to the reality 
which I myself prophet, a prophet, namely that he really is my savior. You know, if Jesus Christ is really our savior, then we have to see in ourselves that Jesus is actually saving me every day, right? If it is so contradictory, then how can uh, we say that he is actually saving me or actually he is my savior? So if he is, then it is implicit in that notion that he really is saving me. But overwhelming counter evidence, then affectionately, motivationally, psychologically, etc., my confidence is destroyed. My confidence is uh, undermined. This is why assurance is, in a sense, very simple, but in realizing it, it's very complex. If you have not discovered how complex is the re resistance of your being to the grace of God in the gospel, again, you know, we, I, I had a very uh, bold character here some way, right? Like this. I emphasize again, you know, human sinfulness, dead inside, even mature Christians. Same thing, it's repeating here again in emphasis. Very uh, important uh, important uh, uh, message for us to learn today, all right? So if you have not discovered how complex is the resistance of your being to the grace of God in the gospel, eh? even though we are mature Christians, this thing is going on in, in, inside, of, uh, inside of us every day, every moment. Then you have not yet really discovered the grace of God in the gospel, unlayering the complexity of the sinfulness of your heart. In other words, if we become truly mature Christians, then the more mature we become, then the humbler we become. Oh, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm the worst sinner. I sin every day in, in, you know, in, in me because it's so resistant. But if you're immature Christian or new believers, beginners, usually what they say, Wow, I have a confidence, you know, today I pray, I receive answer, everything. That is the rather sign of immaturity as far as Christian uh, uh, life concern. You get it? <clears throat> without this, see, so without this kind of a, a real, realization, you are a novice, you are a beginner. In the Christian life, the nearer you are to God, the more you are to say, wretched man that I am. You know, look, for example, if you come closer to the light, then what happened? Then the more, you know, hidden things inside of you will be exposed to the light, right? If the light is dimmer, that is Christ is a dimmer then I think I'm okay because nothing bad is exposed. That's what it means, all right? So part of the glory of a totality of gospel is that at last in the resurrection, we will be truly integrated people. And see, ah, the hindrances to assurance. First of all, and perhaps the single most obvious hindrance to assurance is what? The confusion of the foundation that is Christ Jesus on which our salvation rests with the fruit that our justification bears. So, for example, you know, I, I, I live a good Christian life. Then what? Then, wow. 
I'm sure of my salvation. Look at, you know, the way I change. That is a confusion, right? This is very delicate difference. You know, in, in previously I said, uh, this no set. The ground is Jesus Christ and his grace and faith in him. But still, our Christian life is linked, inseparable, right? But now here says, because it's inseparable, when I see my Christian life and thinking that, wow, I, am, I have assurance of salvation. Look at my uh, Christian life. That's dangerous. Why? Because it is the confusion. No, no, no. Our salvation, our salvation comes from Jesus Christ alone. And the, your Christian life is the only the fruit eh? that Jesus Christ, the, the Holy Spirit bears. Right? So this is exactly that meaning. If you confuse this way, then the more time pass, then it will, it will hinder to your assurance instead of helping your assurance. Okay? So, don't be confused. The foundation with the fruit that you the, the justification bears okay the second one is just taking this folder you know, the first one there is that confusion of understanding and now the confusion and contradiction in consistent living okay what it says this leads to lack of assurance. James brings this out rather strikingly. Let's read what James 1, 6 through 8 says. But what he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think, he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Look at this. Where consecration is lacking, instability flourish, and thus assurance is destroyed. This is why in the New Testament, believers are constantly to be urged to unreserved consecration. Yeah, so what he's saying is, look at this. You know, I'm going to sum up all this, what we have learned so far. On the one hand, our assurance cannot be directly linked to the reason because of my uh, obedient life or Christian life or good, uh, 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 you know, things. Why? Because the foundation and reason only come from Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, if you lack in your Christian life, that shows the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then what? That it will hinder your, your confidence in your assurance. You get it? Yeah, so always balance. It's the same. Let me, uh, let me uh, reiterate it as an illustration. For example, you're a pastor, and now you deal with your congregation. There are two kinds of people, right? One, on, on the one hand, you will have a, a, a believer or church member who says, who, when you see that person, you're a little bit doubtful whether he or she is a true Christian. But he, she says, I'm confident on my, you know, a salvation because that's what the Bible promised. And then the way 
they live, the way he or she lives, is, you know, very unchristian life, you know, full of sins. That's one kind. And another kind is opposite. You see, that person tried to live a very obedient Christian life, but somehow lacking, you know, of assurance. And always keep doubting, you know. Oh, I'm not good. I'm not uh, worthy enough. I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not sure whether I'm saved or not. Okay, your pastoral ministry should be different. On the first case, you have to, in a sense, really confront that person and ask him, if you're truly Christian, how can you live that kind of life? You have to confront them. In second case, you have to encourage that person, right? Hey, you look at yourself, you know, the way you live and the way you, you, you follow. As a pastor, I know that you're, you're born again Christian. You're a good Christian. Yeah? Don't undermine Jesus Christ. It's not you, you know. You're already saved person. But because of your temperament or because of your, you know, a tendency, they, but don't do that. That undermines your assurance. That's why you're lacking assurance. I know that you love Jesus. I know that you try to, you know, uh, uh, follow uh, Jesus' uh, commandment because you love him. That's all. All right? So you keep loving Jesus. And don't look at yourself too much. Yeah? Nobody can be saved from looking at or herself inside because, you know, nothing can contribute to our salvation. Everything comes from Jesus Christ, 100%. That's why we say 100% we have to believe in Jesus. Okay, so this, you know, pastoral uh, uh, focus is different, right? That's all this is talking about. The third is a misunderstanding of the role of affliction in the Christian life. Yeah, today it's all pastoral implication a lot. Many people, even though they are saved, their understanding of affliction or sufferings are like unbelievers. Oh, uh -uh, no. Affliction has a several functions. First is it's corrective. But it may be misunderstood as evidence of illegitimacy. What does it mean? You know, a lot of people say that, you know, when they suffer, then they say, wow, that is punishment from God, right? Confess your sin because what did you wrong? Like the Job's three friends in the book of Job in Old Testament, right? Yeah, you, hey, Job, you should repent because the way, you know, they look at Look at you and your family, what has happened? Unless you sin grievously, why are you in the kind of terrible situation right now? And Job says, no, I'm innocent before God. God knows me. You know, don't say that, you know. Because the, uh, Job's friend misunderstood affliction. 100% as the punishment from God because of a sin, all right? That is what it means. It may be misunderstood as evidence of illegitimacy. It is intended as an evidence of sonship. It's almost the opposite. You know, you and me, we are, we are believers, we are Christians. Then from that moment, Anything bad, according to worldly standard, happens. All these afflictions, bad, seemingly bad things and suffering come to you. That is the evidence of our childrenship. Because Hebrew 12, 10, 11 teaches that God disciplines us because we are his children, right? 
non-believers are not God's children, so God just give them up. Leave them the way they, they please to live. Like Romans chapter 1, right? But in case you and me, we belong to God, we are his dear children, God will not never take his end of us, always in, in, intervening us in the form of a suffering, in the form of a discipline. You get it? Yeah, so this is a uh, misunderstanding. Unfortunately, so many, you know, immature Christians thinking that way. If, you know, uh, physically uh, something goes well, then they say, wow, God bless me, you know, wow, look at this, everything goes so well, it's because of God. And something goes wrong, then, oh, you know, something wrong. So you have to confess your sin and, you know, it is punishment, things like that. No, no, not always like that. Some cases, yes, but some cases, wrong. For everything. But we can say only one thing. It is corrective in case of God's children, believers. Right? And this is the evidence of a sonship, that we are the children of God. Yeah, so we have to interpret things in a biblical way always, all right? And fourth, a misunderstanding of the nature of sin. We misunderstand the nature of sin. While the reign of sin is ended in the life of the Christian believer, look at this, the reign. That means Satan no longer can reign over us, right? He can influence us. He can tempt us. But we are no longer Satan's slave, Satan's children. The reign is over. Yeah, but some, some Christians misunderstand the nature of sin. Well, how they misunderstand? While the reign of sin is ended, in the life of Christian believer, still the presence of sin is there until we die, right? Still the presence of sin remains in the life of the believer. Many young Christians are shocked and surprised at their enjoyment of assurance by their discovery of the ongoing influence of sin in their lives. What do you mean that? You know, usually the, the beginners, the novices, the uh, Christians, they think the moment they were born, you know, uh, the, became Christian, they think everything changed 100%, like legal aspect or, you know, that's 100%. But they, they do not know the progressive nature of sanctification, right? It is not just 100% overnight, like legal uh, proclamation. So we have to fight against the sin, indwelling sin, until the rest of, of our life. They do not know that. Yeah, so they said, you're all filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. And one day, they realize themselves. They are in the midst of a full sin. And they, they all become sh so sharp. And what happened then? Then they, they begin to doubt of their salvation. Oh, I thought I was, you know, a full Christian, but now look at me. I'm not a Christian at all. I'm worse than a believer. Okay. So that can only be dealt with not by talking with them about assurance, but by helping them to understand just what is involved in the release from the dominion of sin. Okay, you can talk to them like this. No, the moment you believed in Jesus Christ, yeah, you legally Oh, where is it? Uh 
I, I, I was looking for the chart, but I couldn't find. No problem. You already know the chart, right? Yeah. On the one hand, you, you are on the right hand, legally 100%. That's what uh, the, the beginners, the beginning Christian think, not only legally, but actually, but no, actually, so everything we have to transfer, yeah, from left to right for uh, sanctification, right? But they do not know that fact. Yeah, so you teach them now the reign or dominion of sin and the indwelling of sins are very different. You are no longer under the dominion of sin. That's for sure because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you have to fight against sin all the time because of the indwelling of sin. All right? That's what it means. So this is the, their confusion or misunderstanding of the nature of sin. You know, sin is not this simple. The moment you believe in Jesus and all sins are gone, Yes, on the one hand, that is right, legally or position-wise. But actually, existentially, progressively, state-wise, you are always moving from unbelief to a belief, even belief to unbelief. So they can only be, the, oh yeah, all right. Fifth. The natural temperament of some may be a hindrance of assurance. I just talked about, you know, some natural uh, temper, uh, uh, temperament of some may be a hindrance. You know, some people by nature uh, have a kind of a gloomy character, uh, uh, have a depressive uh, 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 character or tendency. Yeah, and you have to be careful dealing with that, those people. It recognizes the sheer complexity of individual life, the baggage that an individual brings to the gospel may militate against one aspect of the gospel at the psychological level in one individual in a manner which it does not in another. Yeah, it put it differently, it varies. All individual Christians varies in their temperament. I already, we, we already covered all these idiosyncrasies, right? Distinct characters we all have. So, because assurance is a matter of objective and subjective matter, it is about my assurance. So, it is very complicated. You cannot just flatly deal, you know, in a, uh, uh, in a uh, one way or uniform way. You cannot do that because there are many people in this kind of case with a, a different temperament. So as pastors, we must be acquainted with the resources in the gospel which will help them. One of them is the teaching of the uh, epistle of the Hebrews of the closeness of our humanity to the humanity of Jesus Christ and strengthen the Jesus Christ that gives us. You know, so e epistle of uh, uh, Hebrew is a very uh, good counseling book, so to speak. You know, when you counsel, when your uh, congregation, you know, that will very help. Uh, will be very helpful. All right. Sixthly, attacks of Satan are barriers to assurance and inevitably have this specific goal. All right. What does it mean? The devil is a theologically a Calvinist. What does that mean? He knows. There's nothing he can do to destroy the salvation of redeemed. Why? Because we teach that you're once saved, then you're saved forever, right? So the, the Satan knows when Satan tried to meddle 
into in you know tempt you he knows he can never take away your salvation but at the same time he knows at least that he can influence you with the temptation and deception right so he will do everything under his power to destroy the enjoyment of the salvation okay it is a denier of the graciousness of god's purpose not just of the authority of his word but the source of such denier is ultimately satanic yeah so you know when you read westminster confession of faith uh, chapter 18 this is uh, uh, regarding uh, assurance very helpful it says you know Christians are often subject to sudden or vehement temptation. You know, even though you're a mature Christian, still sometimes you will be tempted with a sudden and vehement temptation. And sometimes you even yield, succumb to that temptation. So you may lose your assurance for the time being because of that kind of temptation. But it does not mean that your salvation is revoked. No, because it can never happen that way. You know, ne next week or we're going to cover the last one, perseverance. You know, what does perseverance? You will endure to the end and will know more. Okay? So we ought not to minimize the biblical emphasis on the principle that in all Christian activity, we are never wrestling merely against flesh and blood, but always against principality and powers. Hey, guys, you know, we Asians in general, Asian Christians are more spiritual in this sense. We believe in, you know, uh, existence of Satan, and we believe in the existence of uh, 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 demons, right? Because we experience, our society experience every day. But, you know, European, the, the Western Christians, they only believe in, in their head, most people. That's why, actually, their faith cannot be strong enough in that sense. But you and me, we truly believe these things because we see and see those people who are demon-possessed people, you know, and those things. And when you go to, you know, I used to go to a, a fortune tellers or shamans, you know, their they, they uh, villages, you know, particularly rural areas, you know, those villages. And I go there. And amazingly, some, you know, a, a, a shaman immediately know that I am a pastor. Can you imagine that? <laughs> hey, you're a pastor. How come you come here? You know, I'm surprised. You know, how did you come to know? You know, they are really demon possessed uh, people, right? You know, so demon teach them. Oh, that guy is a pastor. You know, and if I say it like this, then the Western Christians uh, they seldom believe that. But you believe that, right? Because we know. All right. Seventhly, our own consciousness, uh, consciences may be considerable hindrances to assurance, as in 1 John 3, 19 and 20. Yeah, this is another thing that you have to read this, you know, very, this is what our conscious always try to condemn us. But God is greater than our conscience. That's what he said. You, you can find that verse is very surprising. Our hearts condemn us, but God is greater than our hearts. Our conscience may be major hindrance to assurance. Because, you know, our your conscience and my conscience always keeps me. Oh, you're not. No, 
you're not good enough. You know, you, you shouldn't have confidence. You shouldn't have assurance. This conscience, but there is a weak conscience. There is not strong conscience. We learned that already when we talk, when we learned about adiaphora. You remember, you know, the uh, Christian ethics, adiaphora, in different things. So we cover at that time Romans chapter 14, particularly. Whether you're free, you know, to eat meat, sacrifice to the idols. But the beginning, a Christian weak faith, you know, weak conscience, they say they, they shouldn't not eat, you know, those kind of cases. Our conscience may be a major hindrance to assurance. So we are our own worst enemies in this case, by the way in which it inherently restricts our liberty more narrowly than the scripture does. Yeah, so because of this legalistic tendency, we rather restrict our freedom in Christ Jesus more narrowly. We cannot fully enjoy, you know, Christian freedom. I'm not talking about Christian licentiousness, Christian, you know, uh, sinning uh, uh, indulgently. No, that's not what I'm saying. But we narrow down. So we have many things, you know, we can enjoy. We still cannot enjoy because of this, you know, con consciences telling us don't do that. All right. So this is by the way in which we it inherently restricts our liberty more narrowly than the scripture does. Therefore, our conscience points in the direction of God of restriction rather than God of grace. Christians who tend to tend to restrict uh, their liberty more narrowly than scripture does always restrict it on the basis that they have a strong conscience. But this is the opposite way. Rather paradoxically, Paul calls the strong conscience the weak brother. I just mentioned, you know, Rome chapter 14. It is the liberated brother who is the strong brother. You can eat any kind of meat because meat is a good thing from God, right? But we brother think because it is sacrificed to the idols that you should not eat. You must not eat. That is a you know, weak brother. For Paul, the genuinely strong brother is the one whose conscience has been shaped and framed to the liberties of the gospel that are found in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus said, you know, I came to save, to deliver, to give you freedom. For that purpose I came. Enjoy life. Enjoy life is not sinning. Opposite, you know, God-given benefit. Jesus Christ and who thereby view God cheaply in the generosity of God rather than the restrictions. Who view divine law within the context of a divine grace and not the other way around? Okay? But the New Testament recognized that this is the endemic problem for us. Genesis 3.1, again, all believe the Satan lie that God is the restrictor of our liberties. Because he said, do not eat that forbidden fruit, rather than generous provider of all our needs. When God said, do not eat that forbidden fruit, is what? Is it restriction of freedom or is it a providing true freedom? When you eat of it, that is sin because you're against my uh, commandment. You know why we need commandment? Because we are the creature. You know, whatever you want to do, then you become an well, anarchist. Why we need, you know, 
kind of a less perfect government, less perfect, perfect authorities, better than anarchistic system, right? If your, your, your ability to not have a law, then what happened immediately? A person stronger than you are will come to you, so cloud too, and then rob everything that you got. <laughs> That's anarchist. Yeah, so Genesis 3 1, all believe the Satan lie that God is the restrict of our liberties rather than the generous provider of all our needs. And also, uh, uh, the Rook story is it uh, 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 chapter, what is it, uh, uh, 15? The brother, elder brother, used the father chiefly as a restrictor of his liberties rather than the uh, generous giver of that liberty. That's why he said to his father, all these years I've been slaving for you. So what the father said, hey, son, this is all yours. But you didn't enjoy this liberty. It's already yours. But in your legal mind, you restrict yourself. Right? Yeah, so a prodigal son and legalistic son, neither of them really know the gospel, right? And eighthly, assurance may be hindered by an absence from or misuse of the means of grace. Let me repeat again. Assurance may be hindered by an absence from or misuse of the means of grace. Of course, what is the means of grace? Worship, reading the Bible, prayer, you know, have a fellowship, been together, those things. Participation in the sacrament, all those things. And if you do not do that, absence, or if you misuse those, then what? Then, of course, your assurance will be uh, uh, diminished. So the Lord's Supper and baptism serve in a very great ways toward the assurance of the people of God. Counselors must require that the person be exposed to that chief means of grace that God has given to us to bring us from darkness to light from disorder to order, from lack of assurance to full assurance. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, you know, if we have a, a plenty of time, then we go deep in this. You just don't say, you know, read the Bible and pray hard. That doesn't help much. How you read, and what is the content of the, uh, why you need to uh, read the Bible every day? You know, what kind of attitude, what kind of motive in your heart? Those things, you go deeper, 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 narrow, 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 until what? You are, until their practical problems be solved. You have to have a, that kind of a living a knowledge or experience, you know? In order for us to do that, we are the first one to experience the power of the gospel in our lives, all right? Then we can help. All right. Uh, finally, the fruit of assurance. The fruit, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you, you read this, you know, so it doesn't just repeat that. Uh, Chapter 18, uh, section 3. Okay, just a minute. Okay, let me just uh, say this. Uh, section uh, chapter 18 section 3 says this infallible assurance 
does not so belong to the essence of faith. I just told you, right? It is not. It does not belong to the uh, uh, essence of a uh, uh, of faith. Still, you you can be saved without the assurance. But it's very hard for you to enjoy Christian life without assurance. But that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet, being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, it just say that, right? Right, ordinary, uh, right use of the ordinary means attain thereunto. And therefore, it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence. It is our duty, we diligently work to make his calling and election sure. We have to diligent in our daily life, right? In keeping God's word, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. That's a fruit of assurance. So far is it from inclining man to lose his ness. All right. So you will find almost endless series of studies given to you by the confession and a catechism. Yeah, so, you know, I sent you before all this, you know, uh, confession of faith and catechism, uh, things like that, and you refer to that all the time. And we, it will give you a lot of a, a preaching or Bible study material. Actually, I engage in many Bible study even now. You know, I always use Westminster Confession or Heidelberg Catechism or Shoro or, you know, Shoro Catechism or a larger Catechism like that. It gives you plenty of a Bible study material. All right, we have about 15 minutes left. So, is it, what do you think? You, you ask question and we finish and we go to perseverance next week or we go to this uh, now and next week uh, we have a available time for a question and answer yes professor i think the lectures is really uh, helpful for us especially for me because i'm just a little student left in here and i really happy for learning this course you can go to perseverance for like uh one page and two page i can listen and also okay. you can take more extra time as well yeah but i guess you're the only one now all other students are somehow unstable i i think yeah they have a, a problem with the internet connection so just okay. me here all right all right just that in 10 more minutes we go right the final one is a perseverance let us keep this within our overarching principle of union with Christ. You know, now you remember that we are taught all these things in the context of union with Christ, right? If it is true of assurance that it is flowered within us, uh, oh yeah, flowered within union with Christ, then perseverance must be spoken of in terms of the realization of that union with Christ in its permanent form. The outworking of principle that nothing can separate those who are united to Christ from the love of God that is given to them in Christ. Yeah, so again, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 17, deal with the uh, doctrine of perseverance can neither totally fall away, right? Number one, notice that this statement and analogous ones elsewhere in the reformed tradition dissolves two misconceptions 
of the reformed faith and security. It repudiates the notion that a man may live any way he pleases and still be saved so long as he is elect. But you know, there are many, there, there are many uh, 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 people in the church who think this way. If I, for example, teach them, okay, our reform uh, 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 theology teaches that once you're saved, then you're saved forever. And if you truly elect, then you will not lose your salvation. Then immediately what they think is, uh, okay, now, no matter what kind of life I may live, still it's guaranteed. You know, my final salvation is uh, 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 never uh, intact. No, no. Perseverance doesn't mean that. Perseverance, doctrine of perseverance means you truly, literally persevere. It means you keep your faith life to the end. Nobody can take away that. So if you don't believe, then no, 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 no. It doesn't mean that, okay? So perseverance, therefore, and the security of the saints takes place within the ongoing context of actual sanctification. Yeah, so sanctification and perseverance very uh, uh, intimate relationship. Perseverance is a sanctification in its long-term dimension. Okay. Secondly, notice that the confession hints that pers perseverance is not necessarily a straight line graph. Yeah, it's not like this. On on deviating progress towards glory from, pers from the perspective of experience of the believer. Rather, the perseverance in view is such a divine commitment to the reality of our union with him in Christ that he persists in sustaining our perseverance in, through, and despite our many failures. It is for this reason that reformed teaching on the subject of perseverance, rather than minimizing the warning of the New Testament, takes them the most seriously. This is the point. We have to really reflect on this. Because of the tendency of many uh, people misunderstanding the doctrine of perseverance, says, once I'm saved, I will be saved no matter what kind of life I may lead. No. Then you will read in the Bible a lot of warnings against those kind of lives, Christian life. So it is not the doctrine of a, 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 a perseverance rather than minimizing the warning of the New Testament actually takes them the more seriously. There's no perseverance of the saints that does not face the difficulties and internal opposition of sin and the external opposition of Satan. And for that reason, the warnings and exhortations of the New Testament are not inconsistent with the teaching of the confession. Okay. Yeah, so section, uh, the chapter 17, section one says, we will certainly persevere, but this is not automatic, you know, because we are not machine. We are not just uh, 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 automatically oriented to that way. No, we have a highs and lows. We will have a doubt and strong faith and fluctuate. And, you know, that is the, uh, our Christian life. But to the end, at the end, we will certainly persevere and 
come off as a, a you know, a, a winner. So rather than speak of perseverance as a something that takes place over the heads of the believers, that means which have nothing to do with our actual lives. No, no. The divines emphasize that perseverance is something that takes place within believers, almost despite what believers themselves are, and is a testimony chiefly to the perseverance of God. Because God persevered in keeping his own children, so we know we can persevere to the end. Rather than God's perseverance make us diligent and negligent and uh, 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 either, but it makes us keep working hard, keep our faith and persevere to the end. It's opposite again, all right? It takes account of the coexistence of sin with grace in the believer. Minimize the reality of, of, of sin and our doctrine of perseverance and becomes unrealistic. Yes, so again, you know, this, this one, and doctrine of assurance, and before that, the sanctification or justification, faith and repentance. You you take in your mind the serious of uh, serious of seriousness of sin all the time. You know, if you uh, take lightly the nature of sin, then we take lightly the nature of atonement of Jesus Christ then we will treat lightly the power of the gospel. That is why the liberal theology eh, became so harmful, so destructive of church. Whenever liberal theology really uh, uh, prosper, what happened? The church disappeared one by one. Why? Because the character of their liberal theology, the, one of the most uh, prominent character is what? Their treatment of uh, sin. They never teach original sin. Eh? That's why. So, if you do not believe in original sin, then you're bound to take lightly the actual sins. And why? Because it is distortion of the nature of sin. Even little sin, you can never solve that problem. You can never get rid of that guilt. Eh? And minimize the reality of grace and the possibility of perseverance becomes uh, here. If you minimize the reality of sin, then what? then doctrine of perseverance become unrealistic. If you minimize the reality of grace, then the possibility of perseverance becomes impossibility. Yeah, you meditate on just one this short statement, and it will really give you the depth of the significance of the gospel. Allow no place for genuine and painful conflict between sin and grace, then our failures in Christian life become incomprehensible. All right? Okay, let me uh, stop right here. And uh, so, Claude, you have a question? Okay, then we stop right here. And then uh, next week is the, our last week, right? A week we will cover the rest and the rest of time we will have a question and answer. So you, you have something then you jot down and ask me next week. All right? Let's pray. Yes, together. Professor. Yes. 
Lord God, I pray that you bless the MD, MA students here, even though their numbers are few. In your eyes, always the remnant are important. Just one person or two students who really, by your grace, understand the main theme, main depth of this uh, uh, power of the gospel and appropriate it and enjoy in their lives, actual lives, then the rest you will take care and you will use him or her to influence the neighbor and community and city and the whole country and the rest of the world. Lord, the little mustard seed, when it falls onto the ground, it, it is dead. And then it will bear fruit abundantly. The same spiritual principle, Lord, equip these MD students in your liking, in your wish, so that they may become your most useful instrument for world evangelization and transformation of the world. In all this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. okay. God bless you. And thank you, Professor. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Professor. All right. Thank you for listening. <laughs> God bless you.